Good evening. It is 5.30, uh, Wednesday, May 11th, 2016. It is the monthly meeting of the Urbana Human Relations Commission. Uh, could we please have a roll call? Francis Rigberg Baker. Here. Carol Bradford. Here. Stacy Burnett. Here. Samuel Bindum. Here. Daniel Larson. Here. Lisa Mosley. Here. Peter Resnick. Here. Aisha Lam Sob. Here. Thank you, Tony. Um, looking over uh, tonight's agenda, is there uh, any additions, edits, or corrections that need to be made? If not, is there a motion to approve? A motion we approve. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Uh, again, uh, looking over our minutes from our April 13th meeting of this year, are there any additions, edits, or corrections that need to be made? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Um, public participation? We, Alex? Daniel, I'm sorry. I was focusing on something. If we, uh, I know that you have a hard stop at 7. Yeah. I was wondering if we could... Um, Move the presentation uh, by Mike Ziri to uh, 4A, so we could do that right away. Sure. And then the second request is to move the EEO workforce statistics approval right after that, and then we can go through the rest of the agenda. Just to, okay. All right, so we do have a, a slight update to our meeting, just the order uh, presentation of things. Um, with that uh, motion, uh, is there a second to approve those additions? I second. Okay, all those in favor, please say hi. 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 Pose the same. Thank you very much. So, um, Alex, would uh, uh, you like to introduce tonight's guest? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It is a pleasure to welcome Mr. Michael Ziri to the Urbana Human Relations Commission. This evening, Michael will present on LG LGBTQ rights. LGBTQ being an acronym for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community. Mr. Ziri is a veteran in legislative affairs and a former Springfield elected official. He is currently the Director of Public Policy at Equality Illinois, where he leads a comprehensive legislative agenda in Springfield, develops critical policy initiatives impacting the LGBTQ community, and works to build and strengthen relationships with officials and political leaders throughout the state and in the nation's capital. Michael, thank you for joining us today. You may begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thanks so much, Commission members, for having me tonight, and Alex as well. Uh, that was a splendid introduction. I couldn't have you know, <laughs> paid him to say it any better than that. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, and uh, just briefly, I'm the Director of Public Policy at Equality Illinois. Equality Illinois is the state's oldest and largest advocacy organization for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender Illinoisans. Um, and, uh, well, one of the questions I get most frequently when I, I started this position last year, uh, January 2015, one of the questions I always received frequently was, well, you have marriage equality. Aren't you done? Isn't the LGBT agenda done? And um, mm -hmm. as I think we'll see by the end of the, my presentation, there's a lot more work to do. Um, and I'm, I'll be mindful of the Commission's time, so I'm I'll try not to talk too much, but let me get started. So Equality Illinois, of course, I just mentioned we're the uh, state's LGBT uh, advocacy organization engaging in education, advocacy, uh, electoral politics, and um, social justice work. Uh, so we educate, we host seminars, we host trainings, we have a variety of publications, which I can mention at the end of the um, presentation, but we're very active around the whole state. Um, I love going everywhere in Illinois and speaking about these issues and really educating because passing laws is the first step. And after that, you have to educate the public and also educate those who are affected by those laws, that they have these tools that they can avail themselves of if they've been discriminated against or if there's been a hate crime or any kind of uh, harassment of the situation. So we're really you know, focusing on education as a way to achieve lived equality in the state of Illinois. Uh, but we also, as I mentioned, we lobby variety of photos there. I spend a lot of my time in Springfield. Uh, as a former Springfield resident, I spend a lot of time at the Capitol. I just came from the Capitol uh, right before this uh, meeting. And uh, to pass laws that promote LGBT rights and lived equality in Illinois and
and to defend our victories and our gains um, that we've achieved so far in Illinois. And we also engage in electoral politics as well as our third component. So last June, you know, exciting day. Of course, Illinois was the last state to pass marriage equality, marriage equality through the legislative process. Uh, and then, of course, last June, um, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its landmark decision. Uh, and there's a great photo of the president uh, of the White House illuminated in the, the colors of the rainbow flag. So this goes back to the question I, I was asked initially when I started at Equality Illinois. Aren't you done? What's left? What's left in Illinois? And what's left nationally? Um, so that's why our tagline is, until we're all equal. And just a little background on history in Illinois. Uh, this is the 10 year anniversary, uh, 2006, of non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people in Illinois. Um, before that, various municipalities had such protections, starting with Chicago in 1988. Um, but then in 2005, the state legislature passed the bill, and now LGBTQ Illinoisans are protected when it comes to public accommodations, housing, employment. But also we have LGB inclusive hate crimes since 1990. 2011, of course, we had civil unions. 2014, uh, a strong anti-bullying law, strong policies that schools must follow and implement. And then just last year, uh, we became the fourth state in the nation to uh, pass a, a ban on conversion therapy for minors. And that's very significant. We follow, we're the first state in the Midwest to, uh, to have such a law. Um, the other states are California, Oregon, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. And now other states are following that lead. Vermont, I think, just passed a bill like this. The federal government is considering action against conversion therapy. And if you're not familiar with conversion therapy, it's um, practices where a counselor will try to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, it's very harmful to the mental health of that person. Uh, and we know that so, you know, young LGBT people who are socially stigmatized, who are rejected and isolated, they're more likely to engage in substance abuse, they're more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior, more likely to have depression, and more likely to attempt suicide. So it's very important then that we protect those youth from you know, what's called conversion therapy, which in fact is actually rejected by all major medical and mental health organizations. And so we were able to pass that last year, and then we also passed these two uh, major bills last year. So earlier I mentioned that the hate crimes bill was LGB inclusive. That's because for the 20 years, 25 years it, that sexual orientation was included, the definition only did not also include gender identity. Um, so last year we were able to add gender identity to the hate crimes protections in Illinois, but also uh, we were able to add LGBT community centers. So, for instance, in Champaign-Urbana, you have the Up Center. In Springfield, we have the Phoenix Center. And in Chicago, the Center on Halstead. Um, that is now protected in the hate crime statute if somebody were to attack that facility. And then the other piece of legislation that was uh, passed and signed by the governor last year is a bill that allows Illinoisans to designate in their funeral and burial instructions their gender identity, whether that's a chosen name, preferred pronouns, the appearance of the body. And this comes out of situations across the country where um, a trans person has passed away and the family does not respect their authentic gender identity and presents the body as the body of, of the sex assigned at birth or they would use improper pronouns or the improper name. So we were able to pass that bill last year and hopefully this, this shows that the, just, you know, after marriage equality there is still much more work to do. And we've still got more to do that I, I can mention here in Illinois. Um, but I want to show this map and the significance of this map. Um, and what this map shows is the gray areas are areas that have no protections for sexual orientation or gender identity. So in those areas, you could be, hired, you could be fired from your job for being uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, you could be denied an apartment, a lease, a mortgage. Uh, you could be removed from a restaurant. Um, and this is also important for Illinoisans because while we have these inclusive protections here, if you're an Illinoisan and you go to Indiana or you go to Kentucky or Missouri, 
you lose your civil rights under law because there is no federal statute yet. Uh, and if you're transgender and you go to Wisconsin, uh, then you lose those protections as well because Wisconsin protects uh, individuals for sexual orientation but not gender identity. Um, so what we see here is really a, it's almost, it's, it's very similar to the map, to the, to the kind of map we saw for marriage equality where Illinois had marriage equality in the law, Iowa, but other states didn't. So you had a real patchwork quilt of laws and protections, which is why I think that really shows the need for a federal law, because some states aren't going to pass these protections. In fact, some states, like North Carolina, roll back their protections. Um, they had protections at the local level, Charlotte, and then the HB2 a few, about a month ago, rolled those protections back. Um, and we've seen some of these bills recently in Illinois. This one was uh, the First Amendment Defense Act is a bill introduced in Congress, but there's also a very uh, strikingly similar bill introduced in Illinois. Um, has not advanced in Illinois, and part of our you know, mission is to stop these bills and to educate legislators what these mean. What this bill, and it's in Congress, and now they're saying we've heard that uh, the House Oversight Committee in Washington may hold a hearing on it. Essentially what it, it does is it provides a free pass to discriminate. If you believe, if you have a religious or moral belief that marriage is between a man and a woman, or sexual relations are properly reserved to a one man, one woman marriage. So it not only opens the door for discrimination against LGBT people, but also against a single unwed mother. If that's contrary to that person's religious belief of how the sexual relations occurred. And that's, it's you know dangerous. It's it's scary, um, but it's one of the things we're fighting against, and we'll fight it in Congress, and we'll fight it here in Illinois. It's very similar to the bills that passed in Mississippi about a month ago, uh, and other places across the country. But another bill that's actually garnered a lot of attention is this piece of legislation here, um, House Bill 4474. But it, what it does is it uh, essentially forces transgender students to use separate facilities from their peers. Uh, so they'd have to use either a single occupancy facility or they'd have to use a faculty facility, restrooms and locker rooms. And, uh, and we strongly oppose that bill and the medical and mental health community opposes that bill as well because we know that transgender students you know, develop and are the best when they have access to the facilities that correspond to their authentic gender identity. Uh, this bill would isolate them, it would stigmatize them, it would make them a target. Uh, and again, this, the legislation came out of a, a, pal a situation in Palatine involving one of the high schools up there. But the language is strikingly similar to the bill that was introduced and passed in South Dakota in February and then vetoed by the governor. Um, and the, the reasons for, for, for the sponsor's reasons for this bill, you know, he, he's argued that it's for the privacy of students. Um, or sometimes they'll say, you know, in North Carolina they say it's to prevent, uh, you know, sexual assault by transgender people. Well, in all the states that have non-discrimination protections, there has never been a case, a documented case of a transgender person assaulting someone else in a restroom or facility. In fact, the opposite is actually more likely to happen. Transgender people are more likely to be victims of violence in K through 12 education f settings. 78% of transgender people report being harassed, discriminated against, bullied, assaulted. In the workplace, 90%. Um, so these are very striking statistics. And for folks who run bills and introduce bills and, and, and support bills like this, they don't mention the fact of, of the violence and harassment against transgender people. Um, and it's something we need to recognize as we look at legislation like this, which we opposed which has not advanced in the legislature. But it is very important to remember that the medical and mental health communities oppose this type of legislation. In fact, in February of this year, seven of the leading national medical organizations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Counseling Association, in, you know, sent a letter to the nation's governors, which I have a copy here for if you'd like to see it or to make a copy of, uh, urging the governors not to pursue legislation like this. And that's one of the reasons why on our advocacy day last month, we organized a meeting with Governor Rahner. And in that meeting, we had a transgender student from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, 
and the mother of a transgender student, so they could tell their stories to the governor. Um, I thought the meeting was encouraging. The governor was attentive. He, he understood the issues, um, but it was very important for him to hear those firsthand experiences, what, what, it, what it means to be transgender and what the experiences of a transgender person is. Um, governor McCrory in North Carolina did not meet with transgender individuals until after he signed his bill, which is a little late, in my, if you ask me. Um, and also, another point I just want to make real quick about the allegations of, of sexual assault by trans people. Two weeks ago, the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence Against Women, which is a coalition of 250 organizations dedicated to stopping domestic violence and sexual assault, released a letter um, basically saying that these claims of trying to protect people, using uh, claims of privacy and protecting people from sexual assault, they're false. Trans people do not do these things that people say they do. Um, and it's more likely, as I said, the opposite is true. And that's a very powerful statement coming from groups who work with victims of sexual assault and domestic violence and rape. Um, so I, I have both of those documents. If you'd like to have a copy, I'd be glad to give that to you. Um, because education on these issues is key to dispelling a lot of the, the lies and the misinformation and the fears. Um, so just some statistics of, of some issues. 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBT. Illinois has 55,000 public school students who experience homelessness, yet there's only 580 shelter beds. And with the budget crisis and homeless shelters being affected, LGBT youth are, there, are affected there, there by that. Uh, and just some statistics numbers, 81%, there's 81% public support for equal rights and protections for trans people, and this is from a survey by the University of Illinois Springfield um, uh, last July, it says July 2014, it's actually July 2015. Um, but it's when you drill down into the, the nitty gritty of what those policies are that uh, that 81% drops down uh, to 37% for trans inclusive policies in K through 12 education. So what this shows is that there's a need, a real need for education um, and, and, and helping the public understand these issues. Because these are, for a lot of people, these are new and emerging issues, transgender issues. So we understand that and we are here to help uh, and to advocate and to educate. And then just some of the statistics I mentioned a bit ago, 90% of trans people report discrimination in the workplace. 78% of trans people are bullied and harassed in schools. Um, and striking 41% of transgender individuals attempt suicide versus less than 2% of the general population. Um, so that's very striking and it shows that uh, there is some real societal issues here in how we treat transgender individuals. And so these are photos of some of the transgender individuals who were killed last year. There were 24 transgender individuals killed across the country and um, these are some of their faces, and it's important that we recognize and see them you know, as close as Chicago for some of this violence. And also uh, a screenshot of some of their names from, uh, with Janet Mock. So what can we do? And this is gonna focus largely on legislation and policy, since that's largely what I do, but there's an education component as well. So we have, of course, our legislative agenda, and just to highlight two of the bills that we are working on, um, and we'll be working on, continuing to work on them over the summer, a bill to prohibit use of what's called the panic defense in murder cases in Illinois. Um, and that's a defense where a defendant will essentially justify their violent acts against someone by s blaming their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, and we saw this uh, in the Matthew Shepard case in 1998 in Wyoming, where they said that, where the attackers, the killers said, well, he came on to us, which, Justi which they th thought justified their violence. So there's some cases in Illinois where it's been used, so we're working on a piece of legislation. Uh, and then also establishing non-discrimination protections in jury service. We're always trying to make sure Illinois' laws are the strongest they could possibly be. But um, I would say the major piece of legislation we're working on this session is this bill, House Bill 6073, which modernizes, modernizes our birth certificate law in Illinois. Right now, if you want to correct the gender marker on your birth certificate, as a transgender individual, you have to have surgery, essentially. And that standard has been on the books since 1955. We were the first state to allow someone to correct the gender marker on their birth certificate. 
the law has not kept pace with medical standards <coughs> of care since then. So this bill would modernize the standard to what's called what, essentially what is clinically appropriate treatment, and that is, would be attested to by your medical provider or your mental health provider. Um, and it's important because if you, as a cisgender person, you may not realize how important your birth certificate is. But it's really the key document for so many other documents if you want to get a passport. The federal government actually allows you to change the gender marker on your passport and your green card and your social security card without having had surgery. So the clinically appropriate treatment. Um, and 11 other states have the same standard that we want to move to. But that birth certificate is very important to getting into school, to, you know, to driver's licenses, to, your, you know, to getting your passport, for all these documents. And more than 75% of trans individuals have not updated their birth certificate. And it's, it's very important when you, you, know, you look at an ID and it says uh, one gender, but the person does not present as that gender. There's the opportunity there for harassment or discrimination uh, or, or assault. So we're working with uh, uh, legislators to pass this bill, um, including Representative Ammons and, and uh, Senator Bennett. And uh, the bill is being sponsored by Representative Greg Harris uh, from Chicago. But there's also some federal legislation. Um, the Student Non-Discrimination Act, which does pretty much what it sounds like it does. It's uh, it would establish a federal policy of non-discrimination and anti-bullying in our public schools across the country. It's been introduced several years now. Uh, last year, it was, it was the sponsor, Senator Franken of Minnesota, uh, wanted to attach it as an amendment to a larger education bill. He received 52 votes out of 100, but of course procedurally he needed 60. And that fit, those 52 votes were very bipartisan, included Senator Durbin, Senator Kirk. Um, so we know there are, there are votes in the U.S. Senate for LGBT legislation, um, but we have to keep working. And then the major piece of federal legislation that was introduced last year, which would really solve that patchwork quilt of non-discrimination protections, is the Equality Act. And it was introduced in the House and Senate last year. And what it does is it amends the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Fair Housing Act, and other statutes to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in these seven areas. So employment, housing, education, public accommodations, federal funding, access to credit, and jury service. Um, the bill has more than, I think, 150 co-sponsors in the House right now and about 40 co-sponsors in the U.S. Senate. It's a bipartisan bill. Senator Kirk was the first Republican U.S. Senator to be on the bill. And Congressman Dold from Lake County was the first Republican in the U.S. House to, to be on the bill. Um, and we're advocating for this for the exact reasons I mentioned earlier, that your civil rights should not depend on your zip code. Um, just like your marriage, your, your, your ability to access marriage equality and the freedom to marry should not have been dependent on your zip code. Uh, it's the same thing with non-discrimination protections. You, you can get married in Kansas on, one, on Sunday and fired on Monday. And it's, un it's an unacceptable situation that this bill would resolve and really ensure uh, civil rights of LGBT people across the country. Um, but as I mentioned, laws are the first step. Education is the next. And that's why a lot of what we do is education, whether it's seminars. We hosted a, um, an ally development seminar for the Transportation Security Administration for the Midwest security agents. We also host uh, training seminars for uh, Cook County Sheriff's Office cadets. Um, we also run programs such as our Out and About Good Business Network to highlight businesses that are safe spaces that uh, are, are affirming of, of all people who attend. We also have our Corporate Social Responsibility Program where we help businesses not just follow the law in Illinois, but really go above and beyond to be the most welcoming and affirming workplaces possible. And then uh, one of, I think, the most important pieces of work that we do is our outreach to faith communities. Uh, we really seek a deepening of our relationships with faith communities, helping faith leaders and clergy and congregations develop and become LGBT welcoming and affirming, uh, but also then engaging those faith leaders and clergy in the public policy process, uh, whether it means advocating for a moral budget that protects vital services for all Illinoisans. Um, so that's just a snapshot of some of the work that we do. 
And uh, another piece that we also uh, work on and is what we're calling the Equality Illinois Institute, the, which we've renamed it to the Equality Con this year. And it's a one and a half day conference. Um, we have one in Chicago, we host one in Springfield. These are photos from our uh, conference in Springfield last August. And we just talk about, we have panelists, we have subject matter experts who really discuss the major issues in LGBT rights and equal rights and equality and in social inclusion and how we get there. Um, it's, uh, we probably had 150 people come to the Springfield one last year. We'll do it again this year. It's very exciting. We have our Chicago Equality Con this weekend. Um, but really it's all about educating the public and educating members of our own community about where we're going from here. Um, and I think of, you know, here's, yeah, so here's the, uh, just the little promo for it this weekend. But um, that's uh, just a quick snapshot of the work we do, what's left to do in Illinois, nationally. Uh, and I think locally one of the, the ways of advancing equality is to ensure folks know their rights. Um, I think so many times people may feel that they've been discriminated against or they have been discriminated against and then they don't know how to follow up on that. They don't know the recourse. They don't know there is a human relations commission or they don't know there is an Illinois Department of Human Rights who can help them or that they have these rights. So I think it's important that we educate members of the LGBT community but also the public about these rights and just uh, help change hearts and minds um, so that we can move to uh, an area of lived equality, of inclusion, and uh, of equality in Illinois. So I, um, I'll take any questions. I appreciate you listening to me and inviting me here today. And, Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions? Carol. I was wondering if your organization um, has done any work or you know of any organizations that are doing work to um, help the transgender individuals that end up in our correctional system. Um, I know that uh, the Department of Corrections here in Illinois has policies related to it, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if there's any additional work that's being done to make sure that they are being treated properly and just even where they're housed at and those kinds of things? It's a very good question. Um, and there are a lot of organizations who work on a variety of different issues across the spectrum of uh, uh, the LGBT community. Um, and one such organization who works very heavily on transgender issues is what's the, called the Transformative Justice Law Project. Um, and I think they'd be a great resource to reach out to. Um, also, another organization concerned about the, about criminal justice reform and the, uh, the school to prison pipeline uh, as well is uh, Illinois Safe Schools Alliance. Uh, and they really work with school districts to implement model policies um, for inclusion of transgender students um, and to, to stopping that pipeline as well. Um, and there are a variety of organizations, um, Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. Um, I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head right now, but I'd be happy to talk to you uh, there are a lot of organizations um, who work on a variety of different issues and uh, be glad to speak with you about them. But those, Safe Schools Alliance, um, ICA, the Caucus for Adolescent Health, and um, Transformative Justice Law Project are great ones. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Peter. So thank you for your great work. Um, a, a request of you, um, or maybe two, uh, you had mentioned early on in your presentation that Chicago passed their ordinance in 1988. We're sort of proud here that we uh, beat them by about 13 years. Our ordinance was passed in 1975. I, um, I did not know that, and I appreciate that. And um, and and the uh, you know the the slow pokes across uh, Wright Street passed in 77. <laughs> so we we do think that we have a pretty good community. But the request is. Um, if you could have a peek at our ordinance at some point, I don't know if you already have, and we kind of like to lead and maybe be an example for other communities or maybe even the state on language that really would help out. Um, I know we haven't done a review of transgender issues in our ordinance in some time. Um, those kinds of language changes, I know we went through a period where we had to 
change sexual preference to sexual orientation mm -hmm. as we became more aware of the issue. Sure. Um, those kind of things would help us, and we lo we love being the example for the rest of the state. So. Excellent, excellent. It's, it's, it's always good to be the, the role model. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I apologize for not knowing about your, your ordinance and beating Chicago to the punch. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I know Springfield passed an ordinance, who I'm going to say 2003, I believe it was. Um, so shortly before the state did, but thank you. I appreciate the, the correction. Thank you. Fran. Um, thank you for what you're doing and for your presentation. Um, I have a question, sort of a background question. I, I wondered if you knew anything about whether there's any difference um, in terms of experiences and problems and outcomes and so forth with uh, people who are sort of are born gen with gender ambiguity anatomically and, and chemically uh, and people who who have these kinds of experiences or want to change later on in life um, I, and also I, I was wondering how many of each sort of individual um, we, are, we have in this group that, that sure, needs help. Sure, sure. Um, just speaking about the, the population density is, I guess, what you're asking. It's hard, I mean, it, there's no, it, we don't know. Um, there was a, a, a survey done in 2011, whoops, oh, <laughs> Oh, that's you. <laughs> there was a uh, survey done in 2011 by the National Center for Transgender Equality and the National LGBTQ Task Force, um, a survey of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, uh, which is where a lot of the statistics I mentioned came from, that 2011 study. I don't remember the exact number that, uh, of, that, they, that, they, uh, that, that they gauged. Um, I believe it was probably around five or 600,000 transgender individuals in the country, and Illinois being one of the more populous states, our percentage was on the higher end. Uh, I don't have those exact figures. I do know the, um, the survey was, uh, they redid it again last year, so we should see some more data this year, and I know they had more participants last year than they did in 2011, um, so that really should give us uh, a strong picture of where things stand now, um, and so uh, I think we'll look forward to those report, those numbers coming out probably later this summer, I suspect. And you were asking also about um, I think in, we mentioned intersex individuals, intersex hermaphroditic or related, because it seems to me that when those children are born, they immediately are confronted with uh, the issue, mm -hmm. um, and their and their parents or doctors. I don't know how things are now, but they weren't so enlightened in the past. Um, try to make the child or decide what to do with this child anatomically and so forth and ide in terms of identity. And um, I'm just wondering, I mean, it seems to me that work needs to be done at that juncture in the <laughs> a I, lot I, of people's I, lives. I agree. And um, one of the things I didn't mention, but I, I'm going to, House Bill 6073, the one I mentioned, the, which modernizes our birth certificate law, it also includes intersex individuals. So if an individual has undergone, if a transgender individual has undergone the clinically appropriate treatment or the person has an intersex condition, then they can change the gender marker on the birth certificate. But you are right. Um, you're assigned a, a sex at birth on that birth certificate, um, and even though it may not be the authentic gender identity, that you have. Right. In fact, you may be um, surgically uh, altered mm -hmm. or, or, or given hormones to, uh, to support that choice that was made very early in this right. person's life. No, you're, you're right. And uh, I'm very proud that it's part of our bill. I think, I, I think this is the first reference to intersex individuals probably in statute. Um, the bill's not in statute yet. We're still, we're still working on getting it there. Um, but it's something we should strive for. It's, it's really about including all people in the life of our society uh, and not marginalizing anyone and not putting anyone at the fringes of society. Everyone should be included in, and that's why we continue to do the work we're doing. There are some LGBT organizations 
Empire State Pride Agenda, the New York organization, has actually closed its doors after marriage equality. Um, we are not. We, there's more work to do, and we're committed to doing it. Um, marriage equality was not the end of the fight. It was a major victory during the fight. So, and we're, we're proud of that victory, but we know there's much more to do and to make sure everybody mm. is included in society as a full and equal citizen. Alex. I thank you, Peter, for clarifying that we have a historic ordinance in Urbana. Actually, if you look at the monitor in front of you, you'll see that recently I updated our website to actually promote that. It, uh, since 1975, we've been on the job. Uh, I did have a question. In the presentation, there was a reference to um, jury laws. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, that struck me as an area where I'm not uh, very well sure. oriented. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, about sure. that? Sure. So, I'll go back in history to about 19, I think it was 85, there was a, a, a U.S. Supreme Court <coughs> case, um, Batson, I can't remember the name of it, but it was, it's called the Batson Decision. And what it was is uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said that you can't strike a juror from a, juror, from a jury because of that juror's race. Um, there was a case, I want to say it was probably, I think maybe Kentucky, where uh, a juror, a black juror, was struck from the jury pool. Um, and the Supreme Court said that. And then later on, the Supreme Court extended that same protection to, uh, to women. And uh, now there are stat various statutes across the country um, prohibiting that kind of discrimination in jury service. Um, the federal government has a statute, and the protected categories there are race, and I'm probably going to forget, it's, it's a list, race, gender, economic status, um, color, uh, religion, um, and then other states have similar protections. California has protections that include sexual orientation and gender identity. And there was a, a federal case um, in 2014, 2013 in California between two pharmaceutical companies where one of the companies struck a potential juror from the jury pool with a peremptory challenge um, and when asked why, he said it was because the juror was gay, or perceived to be gay, and would therefore um, side against uh, the, the, one of the pharmaceutical companies. It was involved HIV, AIDS medication. Uh, and the Federal Court of Appeals said, no, no, you can't do that. You can't strike a juror because of their sexual orientation. Um, and then California then went to codify that to also include gender identity for state courts. Um, and then because of that, the, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, now Idaho, Nevada, um, and other states that you wouldn't necessarily think of having these protections in law have them because they're in that circuit. Um, and the Equality Act would enshrine essentially the Ninth Circuit's decision in federal law by adding sexual orientation and gender identity to that list of protected categories. But there have been cases where um, a potential juror has been you know, removed with a preemptory challenge because of perceived or actual sexual orientation or gender identity. Are there any additional questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Keep oh. this. The, uh, material. Oh, sure. materials you said you had, if mm -hmm. you would leave a copy with Tony so that oh, we yes. could get them into yeah. the minutes and Absolutely. such. That'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> All righty. Uh, per our amended um, agenda, we're going to take a quick look at the EEO uh, workforce statistics, I believe. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Make sure I closed all my. <laughs> so it looks like we have uh, two uh, new and six renewals up for potential consideration. Alex, anything you want us to know just as a primer or just introduction, or should we no, proceed I, as, as usual? Let's proceed as usual. Okay. 
Was, was there one last month that we, we did asked for more information? Mm. Did we get yeah. it? Yes, I was uh, thinking we'd go first through the, the new ones. Um, we do have three that are back on this time. 3M, we asked for a request for information to address um, a huge shift in the other category, a huge drop, and then there were drops in the female workforce, and they have submitted information. And then we had a request for information from uh, Autobahn, who we certified for six months, and uh, they have replied with their response. Uh, and those have been uploaded and are available to you. Would you like to do the first, the new ones first, the first three? I'm sorry, my, uh, my, uh, I, only, my only have two. Mm -hmm. you have Nick's uh, actually, I have three. And Ian, yeah, you just three. Have Plumfield. Okay, can I borrow? I'm just going to look sure. off to you. So the know. first company we have is ED Trucking and Lawn Care. It's a very small company, three employees. Uh, so we're recommending that they be certified for two years. The second company is Homefield Energy, a very large company. Their uh, utilization is at 12.3, and we're recommending certification for one year. Followed by Nick's Paints, a very small company, six employees, and we're recommending certification for two years. Thank you, Alex. Is there a motion? I to have get a to question. This? Sure, absolutely, um, Carol. And I've been away from the commission for a while, so I may have known this but forgotten. For the smaller companies, are they required to have an EEO statement? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Because I, I didn't see one for E&D trucking, but I could have missed it. Let's take a peek. Uh, no, it's Is it in there? Yeah, there's. Yeah, it's on the website. Okay. It's also a tab. That was my only question. I wasn't sure if it was included. I missed it. or. They're a champagne firm. Yeah, it was up on the website with the rest of them. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, certainly for um, motions yes. of discussion. Uh, yeah, for purposes of discussion, I'll move that we approve E&D Trucking and Lawn Care for two years, Homefield Energy for one year, and Nick's Paints for two years. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Discussion questions. Um, so, Homefield, we never had them up before that's very interesting something I found <laughs> yes um, they've obviously been in the community for quite some time as part of the uh, um, the electric service um, for the municipal uh, aggregation so where are they located I didn't Houston Houston okay so it's Dynergy not Dynergy this isn't the same company is it that as is responsible for the coal ash pits in Danville. Dynagy, it, Dynagy, they have Dynagy. something to do with solar power. Solar, um, not yeah. electric. So an electric, uh, I believe, power. as well. So Dynagy is the larger corporation, as I understand, mm -hmm. that owns quite a bit. Uh, they does Dynagy still have a piece of Amarin? But in any event, um, Homefield. Uh, I just happen to know because uh, I, I hear about this program quite a bit. Um, in Urbana, we have municipal electric aggregation. So, um, if so long as you don't opt out when you get your electric bill, you're not getting Ameren electricity. You're getting home field electricity, um, and we've got a contract with them at the city um, to provide renewable energy only instead of uh, coal-fired or something like that. So they either do it with uh, renewable energy credits or, or produced in different ways. Um, but the fact that they're a Dynagy company is interesting, but yeah, I think it probably is the same giant conglomerate that does all this stuff, but um, yeah. So do we, uh, they included the numbers for Dynagy as a whole, but did not include the local? That's correct. Hmm. If it's you kind of would like, I can request that. I'm because that is part of our form now, isn't it? It is. I uh, 
I'm not sure how their delivery process works in terms of um, whether they have boots on the ground, so to speak, or whether it's some kind of but what they're delivering through the infrastructure. Even getting the numbers for folks who are employees of home fields as opposed to Dynagy corporate as a whole would be okay. useful information. Um. It might also help their case because what I'm looking at the numbers um, of minority employees, it's very small compared to the large number of employees overall. So I would agree with your one year with the idea of gathering more information about the actual company that we're, we're working with. I notice they're also a union, a use union uh, labor. Oh. So it's something that is an ongoing, <coughs> which is a good thing, but something that re requires some ongoing attention. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'll stick by the, the one year um, on the assumption that with a one year you're doing follow up with them anyway, correct? Right. Yeah. Finding out this additional information so that n when next year it comes up, we have the numbers um, for home field. We know that they've answered these questions mm -hmm. with regard to home field, not just Dynagy as a whole. Um, that would be useful information for us. All righty. Great. Any other questions or comments regarding the motion? <coughs> if not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to renewals. I believe we have six, maybe? Do I have that right? Yep. Okay. We've got 3M Company, one year. We might want to, I'm sure there's maybe some discussion there. Midwest Engineering, two years. Uh, Auto Bomb, six months. Spartan Emergency, one year. Vermeer Sales and Service, one year. And Waters Mowing Service, two years. So with 3M, we had a, an anomaly. What, it turned out that uh, the numbers for their 2015 application were reversed. So we saw a, a over, let's see here, what was it? <laughs> we saw a 34.8% reduction in the female workforce, which was odd. And then we saw a 99% reduction in the other category. And so when I reached out to them, they tore apart their last year's application and found that all, throughout all of the categories, male and female had been reversed. Oh. So when we <laughs> reversed them back, and then they had also, there was a, a, a shift in the other category. So when we corrected that, we found that there was no substantive change. So we recommend their certification at the one-year mark, which is consistent with prior years. <coughs> Thank you for that follow-up, Alex. Um, in addition, I don't know if you see it in front of you, the, um, the EEO and uh, Affirmative Action Manager submitted a lengthy letter walking us through all of the efforts that 3M engages in to ensure that they are not underutilizing in any category. Um, so I, I was pleased with the response, and you have that in front of you. I was very impressed with that list and actually learned some things because there were organizations listed on there that I didn't even know about that they reach out to um, to try and make sure they have a diversified um, pool of applicants for jobs. So I, I appreciated them adding that information. <coughs> And uh, although the numbers of women did go down, um, it, it certainly not severe. as huge, but it looks like other numbers did go up. So um, they're, they're at least making some progress. So that's good to see. With respect to Midwest, they are a small company, currently at 25 employees, and um, they're at 24.0 utilization. And they were previously certified at one year. We're recommending recertification at the two-year mark. It's a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. That's good. Excellent. With respect to Autobomb, they were certified last meeting for six months. And having reached out to the uh, company, they submitted a response uh, to supplement 
the information that they had previously submitted, and you'll see that in the um, April 18th email that's attached. And what I had, one of the, I was not able to answer the last time, I, what, it didn't dawn on me. They are, uh, they hire a lot of uh, union labor, and so their uh, utilization varies. And when they were applying, their utilization was way down. So you'll see that they're about to ramp up again. And they submitted uh, statements for prior years in December or the fall, 15 and 14, and you'll see consistent utilization. And then they went ahead and proactively notified all of the unions of their equal employment opportunity responsibilities in referring candidates. And you'll see all those letters that were generated as attachments. Where is Morton? It is uh, between, I want to say, Peoria and um, Bloomington. Bloomington, yes. Okay. Right in the middle. So this is, is this is the second company that's been a little proactive with their union mm -hmm. people. Right. And mm -hmm. technically, there's no decision before you today. You already certified them last time for six months unless you would like to increase their certification, um, which you can do. Do, you re do we reward, I mean, not to sound like the, their children or anything, but do we reward, do we say, keep up the good work and say a year? I don't know, I'm just putting it mm -hmm. out there. I'm not, I think we were content with six months a month ago. I don't, don't see any need to change it, but if, Based on Peters the new information, how do you feel? I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you're kind of senior. I, I'm, I'm the stucky, huh? No, you're the um, senior. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess. You're. I, so we approved these folks last month, but we uh, immediately got additional information, is what you're saying? Yeah, I proactively requested additional information just to get a better sense of what was going on with them. And as I remember, part of what was going on here is their overall numbers dropped tremendously since the initial certification that we did for them back in 2013 so we didn't want to you know uh, you know put them through the ringer of uh, you know decertifying them because if they're losing employees overall obviously uh, uh, something else is going on um, but can I, ask I, I guess the question is yeah I'm sorry go no, ahead, that's please. okay finish your thought I, I'm, I'm wondering whether we get anything more from them five months from now um, or whether we should give them a year to see whether the changes they've made have played out I could support a year I, with the drop in their workforce by 174 employees they've they've actually increased their utilization percentages yeah they were at 4.0 in uh, 13 and they're at 7.2 and they're about to ramp up for the construction season so if we up them to a year we'd see this again would we see it before the construction season starts next year because if we do it, if, if we leave it six months now we'll time. get them at the end of construction That's season and we'll be able to see what they've done, um, and when will they reapply? I, I'm, I, I'm thinking very creatively as I'm looking at this entire process to recommend improvements, but after I've met with each of you. Um, one thing we can do is ask them to submit their numbers at the end of the construction season this year, and then we already have their numbers for the prior two years. It's in your packet, and then we can see what that looks like, and then, of course, give us fresh numbers when they uh, renew next May. That sounds easiest. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think that it's very important to uh, to reward or recognize these kinds of bad word choice, sorry, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on my part. Provide a care to no, but th these people, these companies that are facing their unions uh, and talking to their unions about this issue because we can't just wag our finger at the union. No. And so, but they can, they're already in a relationship there. And I think that we should remember the names of these companies and, and build on that, leverage that, 
uh, when we're when we're talking to the unions and so far as we can, because well, this is a very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so um, I think one year is a, is a good idea, especially with what Alex has suggested. Peter, and, and just uh, to make sure that uh, it, it's absolutely clear, the section under which we do these reviews of companies, we are actually required, although we haven't come up with a procedure yet to do so, to do the same kind of reviews of those unions. And we are allowed to decertify unions, and we know what the re exciting results of that might be. Well. So <laughs> it, it would be a rather complicated procedure to come up with, but I, it's more than wagging fingers at them, to be sure. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so I believe we have a, an amended motion. Do we need to? Um, we don't even have a motion yet. Oh, we don't? OK. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. I'm just looking at me. Would you, would you like me to continue? Uh, work, continue on through to mm -hmm. the last Yes, one. Alex, I should. So the sure. next Sorry. one is uh, Spartan <laughs> Emergency Response. Sorry. And uh, a medium-sized company, 208 employees. Their utilization is at 10.6. They were previously certified for one year, and we're recommending recertification at the one-year mark. As you can see, their African-American utilization is a little on the low side. Mm -hmm. Women utilization is improving. Latino utilization is on the low side, uh, and which gives them their overall 10.6. The next company after that is Veneer Sales and Service. They are a very small company, 45 employees. Their current utilization is zero. We're recommending I think that's a typo. Let me just double check that. Uh, yes. <laughs> They've been up um, they, for I'm years. recommending recertification for one year only out of consistency because they were recertified f for a year quite a while ago. But if the commission prefers six months, I could support that as well. Again, the only reason I recommended one year is out of consistency with the last certification. And then finally, the last company before us is Waters Mowing Service, very small company, eight employees. They were previously certified for two years, and we're recommending recertification for two years. Thank you, Alex. Any questions, comments? I think they sell tractors and maybe lawnmowers. And, and uh, Peter's probably going to ask me if an omnibus motion would work, and yes, it would. <laughs> Surprised that we haven't seen Vermeer come up again. Oh, they uh, Vermeer. Vermeer. They have. They must have. I think they've come up last because year. I think they came up last year. The major activity um, sale of equipment, parts, and service, as well as rental equipment, and this is clearly for the, the, I mean, Mike Brunk being the contact. Th th this is uh, uh, the folks who go out and do the trees and things. Yeah. I'm this shocked that we have not seen these folks. Project again. on which your company is built bidding grinder. Just to give you a little bit more perspective. Um, <laughs> Again, uh, we recommend a year. Um, they, they supply certain kind of equipment that's pretty environmentally conscious, very safe. Uh, Urbana is actually quite picky in its vendors. And uh, this particular um, unit of the, of the city uh, has received good service from this company. They have uh, some safety mechanism that latches or provides some kind of a cover that prevents items from coming out of this very large device. Um, so it, would al it almost borders on single source, but there are other places that provide this kind of supported machinery. So why do they have the e not available for the E under E about the, uh, have all recruitment sources been notified that the company will consider all blah, blah, blah? 
That I I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. One of the things I am finding is that there is a little misunderstanding about what, what are the vehicles for notifying in, um, referral sources of the equal employment opportunity obligations. Wouldn't so that be like ads? It, yeah, help usually wanted, it's a... Uh, wanted ads they put they, in the newspaper. Or a designation at the very bottom. Right. The, so, I mean, it's pretty standard, isn't it? I mean, it, when you put in... When companies put it, a company puts an ad for help wanted, you always see something at the bottom about... It, it is standard, but not all companies do it. Sometimes right. it's a... Um, it's ignorance. Mm -hmm. Other times, many companies nowadays are not advertising in the newspaper. Uh, they're using other advertising sources. There's one company I spoke to a couple of months ago that said, we can't remember the last time we've advertised in the newspaper. So mm -hmm. when I re reach out with technical assistance and guidance, one of the things I, I'm going to be providing is if you're advertising online, if you're advertising by poster, if you're advertising by letter and all of the sources. Also their applications, just job applications or where they fill out a potential employee, employee puts, you know, an application, I would assume that this would also need to be on there, correct? Yes, although that's not what the question is asking. Right, I understand. One thing yeah. I can ex yeah. expand that to, um, you're referring to question E, right? Yeah. So a, a, a quick search of the uh, of Wikipedia here. <laughs> Goodfield, Illinois, where they're located, right. mm -hmm. has a population of 860. It's an hour north off of 74. But they're also between Peoria and Normal. They are. So they are situated between two locations mm -hmm. that do have a work pool that they could pull from. Right. What, so, what? And sometimes these smaller towns that they're in, those are like also, they use it as a, I don't know, their business address, but it's like a warehouse for equipment. Maybe. Right, because you know, Goodfield is part of the Peoria, Illinois Metropolitan Statistical Area. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Um, doesn't this just mean they don't use recruiters? Because it talks about advertising in the next. What I could do is. Um, or maybe it's our wor the wording for yeah. them is. The recru awkward. recruitment sources very may be not mm -hmm. clear. That's one of the things that needs to change. The, the It's very awkward. Uh, the other one that's very awkward is uh, the wording for. J. J usually gets a lot of uh, calls and confusion. Mm -hmm. Just by way of a solution, what I can do is issue, uh, contact them and clarify and ask them to submit a statement that they are, that they are willing and will notify recruitment sources of their EEO obligations. So I'd like to make a motion um, basically deferring Vermeer Vermeer for the time being. So the motion to approve 3M Company for one year, Midwest Engineering and Testing for two years, Otto Baum Company changing their certification to one year, um, Spartan Emergency Response for one year, and Waters Mowing Service for two years. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Any additional discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> Alex, is that okay? We'll ask for a little follow-up from Vermeer. And, and again, for Vermeer, it's around question E. Is that the concern? Yes. Okay. Yep. I think for me also, I'm just interested in knowing, do they advertise in Bloomington Normal or Pierre Peoria area newspapers? since they are situated between the two okay. so that individuals that live in those communities would know if they're looking for um, employees. Very good. Great question. Yeah, why not? I mean, they have yeah. all kinds of employees. They've clearly had some churn. They, they put churn numbers in, and it's not huge, but they're doing some hiring. So, yeah, it would be good to hear 
how they're doing that hiring. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's back up. Alex, you have a updated um, version of um, the new uh, HRC brochure. Yes, I don't know if you've had time to look at it. I did uh, improve it a little more and have given you a, another version that you can look at and perhaps email me back some feedback. I've already begun to use it at a presentation that I attended a, a while back. It was uh, very successful. I got a lot of questions, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I would like your feedback. It's looking great, Alex. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any initial observations or, or questions for Alex? It looks really it thorough. Looks really good. I like that you broke down all the different steps and explained each part because there's so much technical language in our world these days and somebody mm -hmm. not familiar with that, you've explained it well. One of the substantive changes was also, I changed charge to complaint. A lot of people get confused by charge. Everybody understands complaint. The federal sector follows complaint. The state sector follows um, complaint language. Mm -hmm. And then um, soften some of the language so that it's not so jargon-esque. The other thing that I've noticed is, uh, for some reason, there are several occasions where the city doesn't promote the TDY number. Uh, and so I've mm. put the TDY number in there, uh, which I think will help with um, persons with disabilities. You'll also see that the Commission's agenda now for quite a few weeks uh, has uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator number and the TDY number at the very bottom of the agenda. You might want to put the TDY on the front um, contact information as well. Thank you. Down here. Oh, yeah. My coat's still there. Yes. Oh, we have a machine that trifles Excellent. them. Oh, it'll it'll fix it. <laughs> Every time I print them, I have to read the manual. How do I do this again? So today I just ran it off. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to say this, but um, under the different bases, mm -hmm. physical and mental, I'm sorry that looks like you need both to me mm. i would definitely and say or. and or, or make them separate bullets okay <coughs> got it so if i could get some feedback within the next two weeks that would be great and then i'll finalize it and then we'll get it printed excellent thank you alex um, just a little by way of an update um, the employment poster is almost done i hope to have it done by the next meeting Great. and then i will begin the housing poster and hope to get that done uh, before the u of i and everybody starts their housing season so i've been getting a little bit of housing activity and questions so i want to make sure that we get that out as soon as possible wonderful thank you so i think that wraps up old business so we have some uh, additional new business to discuss um, Alex, um, our, our new resource web page. Yes. So one of the things I've wanted to bring to your attention is on the front page of the commission, I went ahead and put in that we have been active since 1975, and I extracted some really nice language from the ordinance as a um, summary of our mission and purpose and uh, bolded the parts that sort of introduce and close the work that we do. I next went ahead and uh, sought to educate the public on how many members are in the commission, how long do they serve, that they serve without compensation, and that your terms are staggered. And in case anyone wants to come and participate and uh, when we meet and that it is subject to the Illinois Open Meetings Act and that participation is welcome. I really want to drive activity to the web page in terms of our past meetings. We were getting some very nice presentations and for people to be able to view them. And finally, we have a lot of viewers that watch <coughs> from the comfort of their home yes. on the television <laughs> and that stream. Uh, yes, yeah, we have quite a few, lot of viewers. 
And so I went ahead and for those that don't know about the commission that it's broadcast, I went ahead and provided that information. Yeah. And then finally, where the, you'll see now is uh, you can explore the HRC at your very own uh, <coughs> web page. And as you'll see on the cards that were just distributed to you, there's a QRC code on the back mm -hmm. of it. And then the, the uh, <coughs> trifold at how to file a complaint also has a QRC. So when you get there, you will go to the Human Relations Commission. But before I go there, you know that recently we created the HRO shortcut. And so when you get there, you're now going to go to sort of Human Relations World at Urbana. <laughs> and Human Relations World at Urbana are three important units. The Human Relations Commission, the Civilian Police Review Board, mm -hmm. and the Human Relations Office. And if you want to learn about any one of those, you can see the menu on the left. And you can click on each one of those to learn more about. We now, uh, the, the commission supports and sponsors the International Humanitarian Awards. So now they have their own home on the Urbana site, which we didn't before. And um, the public vendors and contractors was on quite a while ago that tells people how to uh, go through the EEO process. Really quickly, when you go to your web page, you'll see uh, one, two, three, four, five new sites that uh, were developed. Uh, a brief introduction, then about the HRC, which educates the public about your mission and your enabling legislation. How to, about the human rights ordinance in detail. And so there are five areas that are covered, employment, housing, financial credit, public accommodations, and we quite forget sometimes retaliation. We protect mm -hmm. retaliation. And then finally we have, and Mike, you might want to see this, 18 bases for protection. And the 18th is a very powerful one, other. This is uh, the Urbana Human Rights oh, Ordinance. And then you'll see information about how to file a complaint. So here you'll see how to schedule an appointment with the HRO, the time limits, what to bring to your appointment, and important considerations. One of the things that I've been realizing is that some people believe that they can be retaliated against, so right up front I tell them you can't. Some people believe that if their immigrant status is in question, they may not be able to come here. That is irrelevant, so we mentioned that. Some people are concerned about language interpretation. That is not a barrier. I have access to language interpreters uh, for all languages around the world and can obtain them through the University of Illinois if necessary. Finally, uh, responding to a complainant, to a complaint, and this is a little more for the employers, the businesses that might receive a charge to walk them through the process. This is a collaborative process. And then finally, how to contact the Human Relations Commission. And you'll see the TDY number, the map, how to get here. And uh, this was new. Um, if you are a person with disabilities and you need information about how to get to the city building, you'll be able to call uh, MTD and obtain that information. There are going to be a couple more web pages coming, but they take forever to develop and code. and. and so this That's is great, this Alex. is the Thank beginning. You. Wow. You've been busy. Okay. And then uh, when you have time, you might even want to look. At, I did the same to the Civilian Police Review Board because otherwise they'll say that I prefer the Human Relations Commission, <laughs> and I don't have favorites. Um, <laughs> and there you go. Finally, I wanted to introduce. Last time we. Um, we assigned uh, some leaders to look at the final report of the task force on, on traffic stop data. And I'd like to put that on the agenda for the next meeting. What you have in front of you is the city council asked me to please help them go through the process to prioritize these recommendations. And in response to that, I prepared an online survey and transmitted it to the council, and they answered the survey all of them, 100% participation. And what you have in front of you is, at the very end are all the recommendations that were made by the task force, and there's some, I believe, 19 recommendations. And as you go through this report, you'll see what the council found as, in part, um, <coughs> A0, 
where they have the greatest level of agreement, followed where they have um, high levels of, uh, I'm sorry, the first one is all of the recommendations by agreement. The second one is the three that they really agree on. A2 talks a little bit about the areas where the agreement is not as strong. It's a secondary level of agreement, followed by table A3, areas where there's high levels of disagreement, followed by table four, areas where there's polarization on the recommendation, followed by A5, areas where dialogue might be helpful as there, there is uh, uncertainty in the essential ranking. Then you go to part B and you see all of the recommendations ranked by how relevant are they if sponsored. B1 then lists which are the most relevant, followed by table B2, which indicates where is the highest level of disagreement. And then in B3, you'll see where is their neutrality, opportunity for consensus building. And then finally, B3, areas of uncertainty in terms of relevancy ranking. They found the information quite useful. Statistics are very helpful, but it is also important to have uh, qualitative information. And so on the next page, you'll see that they shared their thoughts. And Peter, you might find this very interesting, on each of the recommendations. So on recommendation 1.1, in the respondent comments, are, is the city council's thoughtful feedback on that particular recommendation. And then in, as you'll see in under 1.2, what the, res, the, the uh, respondent comments were, and all the way through all of the recommendations. What the city council is going to do uh, after I presented this information to them at their last meeting, they requested an update on what, what, um, what has been done by the police department, by the human uh, relations office, uh, where are we, so to speak. And so I indicated that I would prepare a quick report for them for the May 25th council meeting so that they can begin to dig into which of the recommendations they want to uh, sponsor. Uh, they are having a lot of interest in the hiring of a statistician, and they requested that that happen as soon as possible. And so what I'd like to do is on our next meeting, which will be in June, for us to look at the report from the perspective of what can we do as a commission to support um, optimal police community relationships. This is wonderful, Alex. Thank you. Peter. Just one quick comment, having gone over this, you know, uh, just a brush through. Um, I, I find their lack of agreement about Section 3.1 frustrating um, because it, uh, and a couple of the comments sort of bear this out. It, it's, I think, a misunderstanding on the part of the City Council and it was a more blatant misunderstanding on the part of the editorial board of the News Gazette <coughs> that this is about somehow having quotas of tickets. And um, I, I will give the City Council benefit of the doubt that it, it wasn't made clear enough in the report and that's unfortunate. And I think if they start collecting the statistics, they will get to the conclusion of 3.1 anyway. But the, the fact is that the statistics currently to date bear out that the disparities we're seeing are due to policing practices and they are not due in large part to a difference in the way that drivers are behaving in different communities. And the recommendation 3.1 is to take a look at the policies that we are practicing in the city by way of policing habits pulling over people in particular neighborhoods in order to prevent other crimes that disparately impact the folks in those neighborhoods. And I think we just, uh, and maybe this is a job for the commission to take up um, to better explain that this is not about quotas, this is not about um, treating differences in behavior as if they are the same, or conversely, um, treating equal behavior as if they're different, this is about the policing practices themselves, not about the behaviors of the citizens there. Coming up with better ways to explain that to the City Council might be very useful. Um, hopefully, once they get the statistic stuff, which they all agree is a very important thing to collect and do, they'll see it for themselves and it will be kind of obvious. Um, but 
uh, it, it is frustrating to hear some of the comments here, let alone the more extreme comments uh, in, in the press. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions for Alex? So um, your note says outline a review plan. Do we need, what would you like to do on that in that regard, Alex? In anticipation of our next meeting or in pre preparation for our next meeting. Uh, this is just a suggestion, but I thought it'd be a, a good idea if the leader of each of the areas could meet with a partner and then come back with thoughts about uh, ideas about what the commission can do. Uh, I will be available to meet with the, the pairs to go through the report. I've already gone through it. Uh, and I have some ideas as well. Um, with Kevin's um, moving on, there is uh, the training and development uh, will need a, a new person. So I'm going to make some phone calls and see who would like to carry that. Uh, torch forward so if that would work and then we can come back and just dialogue and you can assign whatever work needs to be assigned at that point sounds wonderful All right. sounds good this is interesting. yeah this is great it's a lot of <clears throat> and then for my report yeah already we have um, in uh, we have let's see here one two three four five six six new substantive calls I receive all kinds of calls but these are the substantive ones and uh, as you'll see we had one in employment uh, <coughs> concerning sexual orientation it's uh, I'm sorry concerning familial status that's in March and that's in an intake process we had an employment call on sexual orientation the charge was filed uh, this last week we have a call on employment uh, regarding prior conviction, and that is in an intake process. We, have a, uh, we had a call on housing. Uh, there was no basis, and uh, there was no jurisdiction based on no basis. There was a call uh, for employment and regarding race, and there was no jurisdiction. It was outside of Urbana. There was a call regarding employment, uh, regarding race and prior conviction, and that is in an intake process. And there is a contact regarding employment uh, on the basis of race, age, and disability. And that is in the middle of an intake process as well. <coughs> Any questions for Alex? Okay. Thank you. In terms of our active cases, we have um, the first case is in an investigation phase, and it should be wrapping up soon. The second case is in a settlement discussion and potentially interviews. The third case is an employment case, and it is in a settlement discussion and potential interviews. The third case is in a determination stage. The fourth case is in an investigation phase, and uh, settlement discussions are, are occurring. One, two, three, four, the sixth case is uh, public accommodation, and uh, I am reviewing the second response to an RFI. The seventh case is an employment, and uh, I'm reviewing the response to a second RFI. And then the eighth case is a new case, and a response will be due in about a month and a half. Thank you. Any questions? Lisa. Can I ask what RFI stands for? What? What does RFI? Oh, our RFI stands for Request for Information. Okay. It's equivalent to a subpoena, so uh, when uh, information is needed, I issue an RFI uh, directing the company to provide a series of documents or information that I feel is relevant to the investigation. <coughs> I do have two announcements. Please, uh, budget report real quick. Probably no change, but. Uh, oh. I do have one new item. Oh, for I'm sorry. You on the sorry, Tony, report. I didn't look. Um, it's the. Um, the invoice for the business oh. cards from oh, Miller yeah. Business Solutions. Uh, that was 20186. It leaves us with a balance of $47.60 in that line item, the printing commission budget line item, otherwise unchanged. And thank you for um, uh, making the arrangements for the cards. Alex, two announcements. 
Tony makes sure I don't spend more money than we have. <laughs> it's so important. It's um, the, the two announcements are the International Humanitarian Awards are uh, scheduled, and we have put out a call for nominations. You have probably received that by email. Please, 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 you all know many people, forward that on to agencies, colleagues, department heads that you believe um, are familiar with who should and could be recognized. It, we do not mind getting hundreds of nominations. We prefer to have choice. So I cannot beg you enough. Please grab that email, send it out, and if there's an organization or a person that you want to nominate, please take the time to do so. I think you have about four weeks to do that. So please help us get out the, nomination, uh, the call for nominations. Secondly, please mark your calendar in order to be able to attend the event. It's going to be Thursday, September 8, 2016 at 5.45 p.m. at the Hilton, Hilton Garden Inn. So it will not be at the uh, I Hotel this year. We're back at the uh, Hilton Garden Inn. And uh, the mayors showed up, several kinds of uh, wonderful people showed up. We had a great time, so I really want to see if you guys all can show up. Some of you were able to show up. Uh, I believe we have uh, a certain amount of honorary tickets that we can give to you. Uh, so if you RSVP, you could RSVP tomorrow if you'd like with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I really would like to see a strong showing of the uh, commission. Secondly, I wanted to uh, let you know that we have ordered or will be ordering your books, Do Not Shoot, and those will be in shortly. Uh, when they do arri arrive, I'll ask that you please read them at a good clip because I'd like to share those with the Civilian Police Review Board. Uh, I was going to order all of them books, and they said they prefer to share books. Uh, that, makes, that makes sense. Yep. So we're, we're not ordering one for everyone. And, uh, and that's about it. Great. Any other announcements? Carol. I just have a question. Will the books be in prior to our next meeting, or are you going to give them out at the next meeting? We should have them by Monday, we should have them by Tuesday. Okay. And are we able to pick them up or get them prior to the meeting? As soon as they arrive, we'll email you, and um, you can stop. By. They'll be in the Human Relations Office, okay. and uh, we can distribute them. Any other announcements? Great, sorry. This meeting is adjourned.